purpose of this video is to discuss confidence interval and uncertainty in the context of sampling theory and forest inventory. So most of the time when an estimate is produced using a sampling method, people will talk about confidence intervals. Uh, the formal definition is a little more complicated, but one can often say that if you did a lot of samples in the same way, in other words, using the same procedures, how many times would the true value be within uh, the confidence interval? Or how many confidence intervals would, cap would capture the true values if you did it again and again and again? Well, what does that actually mean? Well, we'll get to that in a minute with a little simulation uh, spreadsheet I created. But first, uh, you know, why do we care about confidence intervals? So just like with any estimate, we might uh, you know, want to get a sense of how good the estimate is, how much we should trust the estimate. It gives us a sense of confidence about that estimate with which we can make a decision. For example, are we going to donate, uh, are we going to fund a certain project where the estimate is, uh, has a small confidence interval or a large confidence interval? How do we interpret that confidence interval? So the way people would use a confidence interval when making some sort of a decision is to say, all right, I, I've got my estimate that the inventory reported, and here's a confidence interval associated with it. Based on what I know about how they calculated that confidence interval and then based on how large that confidence interval is, because larger confidence intervals uh, you know, what, it would suggest that we have less trust in the estimate, um, we, we have to ask ourselves, gee, how risk averse am I? Knowing what I know about how this was done and the size of the confidence interval, am I gonna make my decision? So an example uh, from a real world application of that is that there's an organization called the Forest Carbon Partnership and they have a, uh, a sort of a guideline here, and this is from a few years ago, it might not be relevant anymore, um, where they look at confidence uh, estimates or uncertainty estimates that are reported along with estimates and they apply some sort of a conservativeness factor <laughs> to uh, the, the estimate that they use in deciding how much they trust the estimate uh, in terms of making financing payments and, and making other decisions based on the estimates that a participant reports. So if you're really interested in that, you can read about it at, uh, if you go on the Forest Carbon Partnership and look up um, um, emission reduction uncertainty. You'll find information on that. So let's go to this experiment that I've designed here. Um, we have a scenario where we have a forest. And let's just say this forest is, is hu huge. It's not just a small area like we see here, but let's just pretend that it's a huge, almost endless forest. Uh, our goal is to estimate, well, how many trees are there yeah, in that forest? How many trees per hectare are there? Well, one thing we could do is we could go in and we could measure every single tree, but obviously that's not practical. So we'll design a sample. And a logical way to do a sample is to overlay a grid over our forest, a grid of squares, let's say one hectare plots. We do a sample of those plots and we estimate, uh, we measure the number of trees in, in that sample and we calculate an estimate of the mean and uh, the uncertainty associated with that mean. So, for example, we might choose a plot and we measure those trees, and then um, we, we go out to a number of other plots and we calculate that information. So in this scenario, I've just used some tools in Excel to create the population. So in each of these cells, using this equation here, I can make an estimate of, uh, of a, a value of, of, of a mean and a standard deviation associated with a certain population type. In this case, it's a normally distributed population. So I've, I've, in effect, what I've done with this equation and this series of numbers is for every cell in my population that, you know, I, I've created a, a simulation where I know the values in every cell and the, the summary statistics associated with these are that the mean is five and the standard deviation is, is one. And I explain this, what all this means and how to run the simulation in this README tab. So let's, you know, this might not mean anything quite yet. Let's go to one run of my experiment. Well, first of all, let's take a little closer look at our, the uh, equation for the confidence interval. 
So the idea of the confidence interval is that this is a, just a simple equation using, using some basic statistics. S is the sample standard deviation, which you calculate right in Excel. N is the sample size. In the example in my experiment, I have one, I've taken 100 samples, just arbitrarily chosen. The standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. The t value, as you might have learned in an introductory statistics class, is, is associated with the t distribution, and it, and it uh, changes based on a confidence level that you're interested in for your confidence interval, and the uh, sample size used to calculate the sample, which uh, in this case would be 100. Um, the confidence interval half width is the t-value times the standard error. So the idea is of this experiment is that you know, if you recall from our from our discussion of what the uh, confidence interval uh, definition is, how many times does the confidence interval capture the true value of the population if I ran the experiment over and over and over again? And in the graphics I'm going to show, we know that our population has five trees per hectare because I designed it that way. And um, we're going to draw, we're going to calculate a sample. We're going to draw a sample and calculate a mean and its confidence interval. And we're going to ask the question, does the confidence interval overlap the true mean? Does it capture the true mean? Here's the mean of my, my sample, here's the confidence interval, and in this case it does overlap. In other words, it does contain the true mean. And here's an example where it does not contain the true mean. So what, what have I done here? In this example, and in, in, in these, uh, this vector of numbers here, I have 100 uh, samples that I've drawn from my population using that equation that I showed you. Up here, I just simply labeled this one as my, the first run of my experiment. N is just the count of those. In other words, it's the, it's the number of cells. I just have a large number here in case I choose to change my sample size. But it, it basically just counts uh, the, the numbers in this vector. Standard deviation, standard deviation, just a simple equation. Standard error, it's a standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, as we have here in this equation. The t value. This is an Excel function to uh, look at the percentile of the t distribution associated with um, a certain confidence level. And the confidence level we've set here as part of the experiment is 95%. So it'll be a 95% confidence interval we're working with in, th in this run. Um, and a certain sample size. And, and, and that is the, num the number of samples in our experiment minus one which is just uh, how the t-distribution uh, is set up, uh, how, 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 the, how this procedure is set up. You subtract one from the sample size, basically. So uh, the half width of the confidence interval is the t-value times the standard error. Okay. Then I can ask the question, does this, the, the confidence interval that I've calculated, which is this thing, capture the true mean? In other words, does it capture five? Yes or no? Return a one in this cell if it does, return a zero if it does not. So in this example, it does capture five. Uh, so I, I've received a one. So I can hit the F9 key on my keyboard multiple times, and I can wait to see if and when that changes. Here we see that it's changed because every time I hit the F9 button, I draw a new sample. These numbers change, and I ask a question, the same question, did it capture the true mean? In this case, it's a zero. The upper limit of my confidence interval is 4 points, or the lower limit is 4.6, and the upper limit is 4.9. This is the lower limit, this is the upper limit. In this graphic, it does, but it, it, for this particular run of my experiment, I would have, it would, it would be beneath the, the confidence interval would be beneath this, this level of 5. The sample mean is simply the average, right? Here I've calculated, uh, this, and this shows up in my next uh, slide, the number of times that the true mean is within the confidence interval that I've calculated. Here is the mean half width of the confidence intervals, because I, and again, this is something I'm going to show in my, uh, in my next slide. The mean of the means, which is another thing we're going to see here, 
and the standard deviation of the means, which again, so the mean and the, and the standard deviation of this of this row, which I'm going to be filling in with, diff, with with new runs of my experiment. So you get the idea here. In just one run of my experiment, I've calc I basically have drawn a set of samples from this population. It looks like this. I'm just randomly choosing a bunch of plots. Calculate trees per acre. Put the value in this in this column. I then calculate the standard deviation, the standard error, the mean, and my confidence interval parameters. And I ask the question, did the confidence interval that I calculated capture the mean? Yes or no? Well, that's great. So why don't I run that experiment a whole, a large number of times? And then this example, this is the same exact thing I just showed you, only each column is a new, a new run of the experiment. So for example, simulation two, is going to refer to the uh, these values, which are uh, calculated from the second column in my set of simulations. So each each column here, all the way down to 100 and end of 100, is a new run of my experiment, and it corresponds with the statistics in each column. So now we've we've got a really interesting situation here where we can say, oh. What percent of the times does the true mean uh, is, is the true mean captured by the confidence interval that I have calculated? Okay, so what I've done in effect is I've, I've calculated 255 confidence intervals from different runs of my experiment, different sets of random samples. I, I've and I've, and I've asked the question, does it calculate the confidence interval? Does, does, it, does it capture the true mean, rather? Yes or no? And I've got zeros and ones here, filled all the way out to my 255th sample. That's, and again, that's just an arbitrary number. Well, okay, well, what does that do for me? Well, let's look at this graphic. If you, re if you remember, we, we, can, we can identify whether or not each confidence interval in each run of my experiment captures the mean, yes or no. Yes, no. We go here, I'm showing the first 100 iterations of my experiment, just arbitrarily. I could have shown 255, but it's hard to see, so I just chose 100. Just, just I could have chosen 50 or 92 or whatever. It's just, it's just and the number, the iteration, or the run number, the iteration number of my experiment. And what I see here is that as I lay them out, experiment after experiment, about 95% of them actually ca ca capture the true mean. Some of them are way off. Look at this one. This one, just by bad luck, by a certain type of sample, just by bad luck, I did not capture the true mean. But most of the time, 95% of the time, on average, the confidence interval I calculate captures the true mean. So what does that do for me? What I can do now is take that information, now that I understand what a confidence interval is a little bit better, I can say, oh, these people reported a total carbon of 100, uh, uh, you know, 100 megagrams or 100 tons, plus or minus 10 tons. I understand what that means. 95% of the time, you know, the, the real value of the total carbon in, in my forest is probably plus or minus 10 tons. I can compare that to another inventory or another source of data and say, ooh, 95% of the time is plus or minus 100 tons. Well, gee, I trust this one more because you know, I, I understand how both were done, but this confidence interval is the one, uh, or this sample, or this, this way of doing it gives me more confidence to make, make a decision. Now, returning back to this simulation, and again, I've got some explanation here so you could study it and you can look at what the equi different equations are doing. What I've, in effect, done in, in this row, in row 10, is I've created a sampling distribution of means. And this is kind of like one of the fundamental things in, in almost all the, you know, the, the, the frequentist statistics that you do. You calculate some sort of a statistic, like a mean, for example. You make it, you assume a distribution uh, of those means, and you can describe that distribution of means and then compare your existing mean, you know, the one you get from your real sample, um, against that, right? 
So here I've got this distribution of means, 4.78, 5.04. On average, that distribute the mean of that distribution of means in row 10 is very close to the real population value, which is a five. And that's one of the magical things about sampling is that if you did this experiment you know, a million times, this number would be like 5.0000001 or 4.9999995. So now let's take it to one more level here. Um, let's just say, oh, I did, I did a sampling experiment. Let's say I went out here and, and did my sample, but I only chose to collect my plots next to roads. Uh, or let's say I, I, for some reason, I didn't like to go into certain areas, uh, so I, I, I changed my sample, or, or I had certain plots here that I had originally selected, but I could not visit for some reason because they were uh, they were difficult or uh, un unappealing for me for me to visit. Uh, what I've done is I have changed the selection probabilities. In other words, every point in my study area does not have a chance of being chosen. And that might, might or might not cause any bad outcomes, but what it could cause is something called bias. So in this example, instead of doing my normal equation to, to draw my random sample, I've altered the probability that certain values are going to be selected. I have lowered the chance, I, I, I basically artificially lowered the mean value. So for example, uh, there might be lower values of the mean closer to roads, like I said, or there might be uh, lower values of the mean in the accessible, the easily accessible areas of my population. So I, yeah, let's say I do that and I plug in all my numbers and I calculate my confidence interval. Oh, great. I, I still got my number. Look, I've got I've got an estimate here. That's pretty close to five. I've, I've calculated a confidence interval for that estimate, right? Great. Well, let's look at the graphic here and let's look at what happened. I had been assuming that the confidence interval that I calculated uh, means that, oh, 95% of the time, I'll capture the true population value. Well, because I did some sort of a weird uh, sampling uh, thing in that I avoided areas that were difficult or I chose the easier areas or areas where there were a lot of uh, raspberry bushes with big spines and I didn't want to go in. I just avoided those areas. And for some reason, I artificially lowered the mean by my estimate. And I still calculated the confidence interval, which looks a lot like the normal confidence intervals. So look, it's about, you know, it has a certain magnitude. The only problem is, I don't know. I, I'm not aware that I did this. So I report my mean and my confidence interval. And on average, it's certainly, 95% of the time, it certainly doesn't capture the true value. That is one of the problems with non-response. We calculate, for, for any given sample that we do, we calculate a mean and a confidence interval, and it looks just fine to us. We, you know, the only number we see is is the uh, are, are these numbers, the the, the uh, sample mean and, and the lower and upper limits of the confidence interval. We don't know um, if it captures the true value or not. That's why we need to be very very careful with non-response and make sure that we do not introduce this bias, or else we're going to end up with this situation. 